Simon Templer. As the stereotypical British actor, Sir Roger Moore was suave, cool, elegant, well-tailored. On the screen, he was the international man of mystery, fighting for justice, battling diabolic villains, resisting stunning temptresses, and overcoming fatal danger. I jokingly say, you know, what's the difference between playing the saint and playing Bond? That in the saint, I did raise my eyebrow, and I don't think I don't think I ever raised my eyebrow in uh, in Bond except possibly when a bomb went off. Sir Roger Moore was the saint, and he was James Bond, and he always played them with class. Roger Moore was born on October 14, 1927, in South London, the only child of housewife Lily and policeman George Alfred Moore. And in those days, policemen, well, I don't suppose they get a great deal of money today, but they, they, we certainly weren't amongst the well-off, although I never seemed to want for anything. I was very surprised to find out that he came from exactly the same place as me and was the son of a London policeman, which means that in the class structure, uh, sort of lower middle class or upper uh, poor people. When we were alone with them, they, were, they would always sort of bring up the fact how lucky we were and how when Roger was a kid, uh, you know, his, the, 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 the treat of the week was baked beans on toast. His parents were very, very protective of him because he, he, physically he wasn't strong and therefore he was never let out on the street like I was to play with the other boys and, and, and involve himself in the rough and tumble. And when he was, he couldn't defend himself. And so uh, you will find that anybody who can't fight becomes very, 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 very funny because they like to turn it around with a laugh. As a teenager, Moore grew up during World War II and suffered many of the anguishes and hardships of the time. The war started. I went to a place called Worthing on the south coast of England, which probably the closest point to Germany, which was a great place to send the kids from London. And then came back to London just before Dunkirk, which I remember uh, very well, seeing the trains with, with the wounded passing at Clapham North, near where we lived. And then the blitzes started. After a few weeks, it was a bit hairy. We lived at night in an Anderson shelter in the garden, which was a sort of round corrugated iron cup, a bit of dirt. It kept shrapnel from damaging you, but it would not sustain a direct hit. By that time, my school, Addison Grammar School, didn't exist in London, and so we were put into a, a central school, and I was able to pursue what I really wanted to do was art. And and by the time I was 15, 15 and a half, my father had shown some of my work to a colleague of his who knew people in the film industry. And I was offered a job as an animated car, as well, <laughs> I was offered a, boy as a, uh, offered a job as a tea boy in uh, an animated film business. And that was the beginning of my real interest in film. And I learnt at that point what cutting was and editing was, which came in great stead much later when I was able to direct when I started doing the Saint series. At the age of 17 in 1944, Moore got his first Hollywood break. I then had some friends who were doing crowd work on a film called Caesar and Cleopatra. And I don't know, I often joke about it afterwards, either my spear was longer than anybody else or my toga shorter. But <laughs> I was, uh, some, somebody said, you know, are you an actor? Uh, do you want to be an actor? And I met with the director and he said, I think that you should be trained. And so I thought, oh, how wonderful. He said, I'd like to speak with your parents. As a result, young Moore studied for two terms at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. It was fascinating because the moment 
I started at RADA. I knew that I was where I belonged, where I wanted to be, doing what I, I really wanted to do. It had never occurred to me before that I wanted to be an actor. And then I left RADA and I got a job uh, with Norman Marshall at Cambridge, the, the art theatre, a, a festival ashore. He had also been an officer in the army, the exact opposite of what I had been. I had been a private in the army, had a very thick uh, Cockney accent and hadn't been to any academy at all. Le leaving the army, having been completely spoiled, having achieved the, the rank of acting captain, and, and having my food found and being given money to spend, I came back to the harsh reality of, of life uh, as a struggling young actor. And, and it was audition after audition. I had to scratch around and, and, and make a living. I did repertory. I did coughs and sneezes in a couple of films. I worked in television in those days at the BBC, which stood me in a very good stead because in 1953, I uh, came to the United States, to New York, and did quite a lot of live television work. Uh, Robert Montgomery Presents. Uh, hallmark. As a consequence of his television work, in 1954, Moore got his second Hollywood break when he was given an MGM studio contract. My first picture, which was the last time I saw Paris, with Elizabeth Taylor and Van Johnson. And I think I was pretty awful in it. I guess I've known Roger since the 1950s. Uh, but uh, at that time, uh, he was probably the most beautiful leading man in Hollywood. I don't think that MGM, when they put him under contract, thought he had a range. I think they hired him as, so-called in quotes, a pretty boy uh, from England who was, who had had a, a background and a craft. In 1956, Moore was cast in a historical biopic of the French noblewoman Diane de Poitiers. The movie was Diane. And they thought that he could put him in roles with major stars where he could play second leads and so forth. Proclaim me your heart. Diane, I married Catherine, but I never promised to stop loving you. All the people I worked with were always very kind to me. And Lana in leading role in a film, and she was very patient with me. We had quite a lot of scenes to do together. Diane turned out to be not that great a movie, and I left MGM. It's, you know, it's that when they take out that little notice in the in the trades that you have severed relationships, they they put it in a rather nice way, which everybody in the business knew that you'd been dropped, and I went back to England. Back in England, Moore was cast in the leading role of the British television series Ivanhoe, a series aimed at an audience for children. The series featured Roger Moore as Sir Wilfred of Ivanhoe, a knight who fought against the injustices of the time. I did 39 episodes of that. The, f the first, unfortunately, they never shot it in color. You know, I mean, it would, it would have st stuck around. Or maybe I'm very lucky it didn't stick around. When I was doing Ivanhoe, I thought, well, now I have uh, gone into television, I will never go back to films. And then fortunately, uh, a film came up, an offer to go back to Hollywood to, to, to test for a film called The Miracle that Irving Rapper was directing and Carol Baker was going to be in. We're going to have Vittorio Gassman from Italy, Katina Paxanu, who was a legend, uh, a legendary character actress from Greece, and uh, an exciting young man from Great Britain, Roger Moore. I was terribly impressed with Roger. He was so beautiful. Tell him I leave early in the morning to report for duty.
Before I started the film, they said, would I work with the dialogue director or Joe Graham? And I said, why? You know, because you sound too English. And he analyzed the problem straight away. I spoke with a clenched jaw. And Joe said, do you, uh, do you, uh, did you, did you go to university? I said, no. He said, do you regret not having been to university? I said, yes. He said, do you feel that when you're talking to people who probably have been to university, that you might make a mistake in what you're saying? I said, yes. He said, well, he said, that is in your subconscious. And so all the time you don't open your mouth because you're frightened of what's going to come out. He said, you're very fortunate. He said, you're, you're, you're even featured, you're six foot two. Why do you stand five foot 10? Don't be timid, don't be embarrassed. Be, it is a sin not to expose what you've been given. He was not only an actor when I first met him, he, he was also a very famous male model. He, he modeled so many pullovers, we used to call him the big knit. <laughs> I think sometimes, from a point of view of just being an actor, he would have preferred to be uh, slightly more uneven featured. <laughs> all I know, basically, all I know is in the 50s, when he came out here, he loved it. He just went out and bought a car and, and uh, you know, and he was in Hollywood. Starting in 1957, Maverick was a Western television series with comedic overtones that ran for five years on ABC. Initially, it starred James Garner as Brett Maverick. However, when Garner left the series due to a legal dispute, Roger Moore, now under contract to Warner Brothers, was added to the cast as Maverick's cousin, Bo Maverick. And we got the scripts from Maverick, and they didn't even bother to change, well, they changed the names, but they didn't change the dialogue. I, I replaced Jim Garner in, in Maverick. They said I wasn't replacing Jim Garner in Maverick, but all the clothes had Garner written around the waistband, and they had to be taken in an inch. Unhappy with his roles at Warner Brothers, Moore was on his way back to England, looking for something better. That something was the saint. I mean routine, we want you on the show just as you are. The one and only, unique, unbeatable, famous Simon Tepler. The saint, he, uh, it was sort of like Roger. He was almost playing himself, very charming, very witty, great-looking, perfect leading man. All the things that uh, audiences around the world have grown to love and adore about Roger. Before I was a writer, I was kind of um, an actress for about five minutes. And during the course of that five minutes, I got a role in The Saint. He was always very kind to his leading ladies because he had a different one every week, I might add. He had the most beautiful women um, that were, you know, in English films. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. <laughs> I wish I could speak French. I think all the true series stars, they have a charisma and they bring something to the character that is within them. And I think that's what Roger did with The Saint. After the first few episodes, naturally one settles into not having to search how you're going to play it because it is just automatic. I just can't believe you got away with it. Didn't I promise I would? Yes. Yes, you're wonderful. Knowing the way the character thinks, of course, it makes it very easy in terms of directing yourself. There's nobody in it. Who's afraid you go right into him? One. This is as far as I go, Simon. I'll have those plans, please. I might. Life is full of surprises. After two unhappy marriages, Moore finally met Luisa Mattioli. They were married in 1969 and had three children, two of which were born out of wedlock. The saint went on for about six, six years. Uh, and during that time, uh, my daughter Deborah was born and my son Jeffrey. 
And then, then when I started Bond, along came Christian. It was like going to the office. I, I, had, a, I had a regular job. I would go to the studio early every morning and would come home every night. So although it was very comforting, I was probably glad to finish The Saint and tackle new pastures. Almost immediately, Moore was on to a new series, oh, hello, The Persuaders, co-starring Tony Curtis. I said I did ring, but you probably didn't hear for the sound of the music. Sorry? I said you probably... Why didn't you switch that thing off? I think I'll switch that thing off. Lou Grade went to America and came back and said, I've sold uh, The Persuaders, which had been an idea Bob Baker and I had had while we were doing The Saint and the character we had in mind to be the other man, which Tony Curtis eventually played, because Tony's wonderful sense of comedy would play very well against my laid-back English lord. It'd be much closer if you'd stop complaining. Do you mind very much if we stop for a minute? Why not? <sighs> oh, how is it you're always clean? because I think clean. Oh, dear, 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 dear. The uh, Persuaders concept was really like uh, an American being an Englishman's servant. It was not unlike Rochester and Jack Benny's relationship in, uh, in their films. Yes. Goodbye. Mm. Is this an excuse me or can we all join oh, in? Sorry. Mm, I like it, I like it. Yes, well, just remember where we stopped. Stay close behind. I may never leave. We found that the... The two characters we were playing, Lord Brett Sinclair and Danny Wilde, we took a lot from ourselves, uh, you know, our own personalities. And, and Tony and I today, you know, have this same sort of relationship that those two characters on the screen had. We were uh, both in the same period of time in our lives. We we're about the same age. And uh, uh, we have had by that time, 20 years' experience working in movies, so it made it a lot, uh, a lot easier for us to uh, uh, work together. Two years later, Roger Moore would get his greatest Hollywood break when Sean Connery, the star of the successful Hollywood movie franchise James Bond, made a big decision. Sean then announced that his last one was going to be Diamonds of Forever. Then I got a call from uh, Harry Saltzman saying that Cubby and I want you to take over Bond. And so they were looking around for another Bond and they came to me and they agreed that I would do it. Sean, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting him here, is a very serious Scotsman who uh, nevertheless can lighten his uh, act. Whereas Roger is a very sunny type of character who occasionally is obliged to darken his act. When Sean Connery played James Bond, he played it as the bad boy womanizer. And when Roger Moore played Bond, he played it as the man that maybe would marry the heroine if the circumstances were right. There's really nothing very much for us to do tonight. Or is that? Oh, darling, I'm tempted. And there was never any feeling of tremendous uh, rampant sexuality. It was always seduction and with a very, very light touch and a smile. Roger brought something different to, to the character. And I think he came along at a time when Bond really needed to change. Because if he continued in the same vein, I think Bond would have become stale. <laughs> Job. Not from where I'm standing. The stunts that he was uh, asked to do. Um, we very rarely had to do things over. The two films that I did with Roger, um, The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker, he was quite unique that he was the same right the way through the film. I mean, these films took 20 weeks to make, and they were very, very tiring for the actor.
but Roger was always the same. I found that Lewis and I have exactly the same sense of humor, the same sense of fun. Roger is always on the light side. Roger has a wonderful self-deprecating humor. Uh, he's a great on the set. He keeps, he keeps the crew in stitches most of the day, and his natural tendency is just to make fun of everything. A lot of the time, I, 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 I laugh at myself, and I think it's a defense mechanism because I, I want to laugh at myself before anybody else does. Also, it's, I seem to have read somewhere that being a comedian is a desire to be loved. I hope you can swim good night. Why this continuing success of a series of films? And I think it's because the, the audiences were never cheated. The money was put up on the screen. It's the comforting thing of a bedtime story. Children like to hear the same story every night. You mustn't change, you mustn't change it. It's, oh, no, no, it wasn't like that. You know, the, the witch came in and then that happened. And, and I think Bond became an old friend with audiences. They knew every two years that there would be this great outgoing of, of, of action and glamour and, and humour. Give my curiosity, but what is that? That's my little octopusy. They were slightly jealous of the villains. And they could step outside themselves. If you, you, you play the villain, you can say, right, now this, there is nothing of me in this because this is the villain. And, and he is rotten through and through, but he believes he is wonderful. Whereas when you're playing the hero, you're, you know, you're just being very nice. I think somewhere in, in, in Roger's soul, there is someone who would have loved to have been absolutely confrontational. In, in, his, in his heart, he, he would love to have been an actor who was confrontational and big and up there. He, he would love to be that as a person. In our business, and your people get killed. We both know that. So did he. My style of acting is is of the style that if the acting shows there's something wrong with it, that, that you, you shouldn't be seen to be acting. It doesn't mean at all that they don't use in the style of the method the experiences in life that they have had, that they don't draw on that experience, that there is, they don't dip into the well, so to speak, and use real life experience in their role. It's simply that they refuse to talk about it. They have a feeling that uh, uh, the more you talk about it, the, uh, the more damaging it is uh, to the actual performance. They don't uh, talk a great Hamlet, they do a great Hamlet. That's the English style, and that's Roger's style. One, two, seven, six, four, A camera. Right, stand by, please. And action, figure that show. Well, I think uh, all of us were disappointed when uh, Roger left the Bond films, but um, Tied and Tied waits for no man, I suppose, and Roger felt that uh, it was time to hang up the spurs, so to speak. Starting with Live and Let Die in 1973, Moore played James Bond in a total of seven films, ending in 1985 with A View to a Kill at the age of 58. The other Roger Moore 007 films are the Man with the Golden Gun in 1974. Three years later, The Spy Who Loved Me, followed in 1979 by Moonraker. Two years later, For Your Eyes Only, and in 1983, Octopussy. After Seven Bonds, I, th I think I, I had a feeling that everybody had had enough of me and I'd had enough of Bond. Although I, I pride myself on being reasonably fit, it becomes rather a dirty movie with, with, with James, an old James Bond leering and leching at young leading ladies. One of the things that you have to look at in films, that all the great film actors had one tremendous thing. 
they had a form of stillness and they were, they seemed to play themselves in the Gary Cooper school or the James Stewart school. Roger was in that school. In other words, he didn't seem to do much, but what he did do, he did very, very well indeed. One actress I worked with in a modeling photograph many, many years ago, and, and then we had a spit and a cough in the same movie, but we never met. But we became friends and we became neighbors, as Audrey Hepburn. And one of the great things that Audrey did for me was to introduce me to UNICEF. That is a side of uh, uh, Roger that, uh, 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 to me, uh, reveals the fact that he's a man who will, who will give, who will sacrifice his own comfort, uh, his own give of his own time, and give of his feeling and of his compassion to those who are less fortunate. So there, there is definitely that side to Roger, uh, although he may not very often reveal it on the screen. I'm very glad that Roger has been given the opportunity to work for UNICEF for the last few years, but he is giving not only to the children that are benefiting, but also to all of us, uh, and it, in that it shows us who he really is. Into the 21st century, Sir Roger Moore only occasionally appeared in film and television. But in 2003, with a great deal of class, this man of humble beginnings received a knighthood from Queen Elizabeth II for his charitable work with UNICEF.